On today's podcast, we're joined by our good friend and world-renowned situational awareness and sudden violence expert, Tony Blauer. SDN regular Dr. Jennifer Stankus lays out four specific and tense encounters she's had, while Tony, Jason Sawyer, and Chris Heaven weigh in with their thoughts on how people can learn how to improve their situational awareness and ability to confront sudden violence from Jen's real-life experiences. And we're back. Today we're joined by Dr. Jennifer Stankus, Tony Blauer, and our very own Jason Sawyer. So Jen is going to be the facilitator today. Uh, She has some very specific instances related to situational awareness and sudden violence. So take it away, Jen. All right. So first, I I feel humbled to be leading this conversation because the people on this call are all amazing professionals who know a lot more than I do. And I'm really hoping to to learn a lot more today. But we'll, I wanted... we'll, we'll, we'll each give you the twenty dollars after we finish recording this. By the way, for sure. Yeah. But we've been talking about situational awareness for the past couple of weeks. There's been some really great information on there, and I think sometimes using real examples. And I want to use four real examples of things that have happened to me and how I was able to save myself in those and get some more pearls and learn what I did wrong, even though I survived, and and how we can improve. But the, the overarching idea here is that everyone can learn this. I don't care who you are. Everyone can get better. Everyone can learn about their environment better. But the very first concept I want to talk about, and this is going to go right along with the first scenario, is this idea of what is situational awareness and, and how do you get better? The first thing that you have to understand is how the brain works. So The brain is getting all this information, all the sights, the smells, the sounds. It's it's going in. It's too much. It's way too much for our brains to process. So what does the brain do? It starts to put in patterns that we can just recognize patterns and and things in our environment to kind of decrease all this stimulation that's coming in. And that's great. It helps us function. But on the other hand, it also prevents us sometimes from seeing unusual things or things that are new to us that we can't really, we haven't seen or experienced before. And we may not even, we may not even see it because, because it's part of this processing that our brain does. I know, I know Tony knows a lot about that and just wanted to get your thoughts on that before I talk about the first scenario. This actually became the first part of our training after in the 80s, when I started doing these extreme close quarter drills, where we call them like jack in the box moments, where we're trying to surprise each other with realistic scenarios. So what we did is we 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 removed the situational awareness part of the equation and kind of like just drop people into here's a problem set. And what what started happening is startle flinch was saving the day, not martial arts moves. So it was like a non-conscious movement of of protecting the head and pushing away danger. And that led me down this, like an archaeologist, down this study of neuroscience, which led to neurobiology. And I make a joke now that neurobiology doesn't care about your martial art or your complex motor skills or what you like to do. Well, that led into kind of like reverse engineering understanding what the brain and the brain is like a hard drive it, it it'll it'll absorb and remember everything but to your point if you haven't educated it the right way so there's there's stuff that a cop will pick up there's stuff that is that a, a really good psd a protective service a individual bodyguard will pick up with their training and we just want to survive. The average person just wants to survive. So, so cognitive dissonance also part of like a, like a brain's response to to avoiding or ignoring danger is part of a survival mechanism too. So, I I get into and I like to to remind people that the more they study the brain and the more they understand it, the more they can actually manipulate their own brain. They can in, in the way of like, I need to understand my brain is going to try and trick me. My brain is going to try and ignore and go like, that can't be happening to me. Go into a denial state, not to mention the literalness of what you said, where it will, like some of us and everyone listening to this has driven home one night and doesn't remember driving. Like you drove home and you're like, I don't even remember stopping. Was that light red or green? Because you're just in the zone and you're ignoring all this stuff. But there's parts of like your reticular activating system, where you the ways you train your brain to notice things that should be important to you. 
change your relationship with that, understand what cognitive dissonance is. And then simple things like, like, like if you get a bad feeling about something, don't shut that down, but to explore that, but we'll get in, we'll get into that. I'm sure. That's actually, I, I wanted to start with the most basic scenario and this one, God, looking back on it, it still creeps me out. So I was, when I was a teenager, I was second in the world in BMX. And one of the reasons why I was good is like, I was always sprinting around on the bike. Two in the morning, I'd be like, I'm going to go chase down police cars and like do sprints up and down the, the hills around Boulder. So that's how I was doing my thing. It was like, I don't know. It was pretty late at night. It was definitely pitch black. There weren't a lot of people around. And there was this route I used to like to go down by Boulder Boulder Creek, uh, like a path. And I'd come off of a road and I was riding my bike and I was about to, I was going onto this on-ramp onto this path down by the creek and the hair on the back of my neck stood up. I didn't see anything. I didn't hear anything. I was just like, holy shit, I'm in a bad place. Oh, sorry. Sorry about the language. You're, you're <laughs> I good. Know. I'm not going to offend all you, <laughs> but, well, uh, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> but I was just like, wow, I'm like, there's something wrong. Like I, this, there's something wrong here. And it was a big, huge, I was on my way home and it was going to be way out of my way to turn around and go a different direction, but I did. And the next day I found out that there was a serial murderer uh, who had raped and murdered someone down on that path that night uh, like how in the what what uh, in the hell did my brain see or hear that i didn't perceive but the thing that yeah. was interesting is that i listened mm -hmm. i didn't say this is stupid there's nothing down there i don't see anything no wow there's something wrong here i'm out of here and i think that's yeah, yeah that uh that little voice inside your head that tells you to stop tells you to turn left turn right I, I every time i've listened to that voice i've never regretted it there's been some times where i've denied that and I haven't listened to the voice and I've gotten by and nothing bad has happened but then sometimes bad things do happen when you ignore those instincts you listen, you stop listening to that small voice in your head but I've never regretted listening to it never once not one time has that ever happened in my life so those instincts I uh, me personally in my belief that's how that's how God speaks to me uh, it's through that small voice on my head he tells me to turn left he tells me to jump tells me to do do whatever. And if I, if I listen to that, good things happen. I, I think Chris and I've talked about this before. I think the biggest thing that gets people in trouble, whether it's your mouth or, or avoiding danger or whatever is your ego. You got to You got to get your ego out of it. If you're afraid about something, listen to it. You're not a, you're not being a pussy or whatever. Just listen to it because there's a reason. Do you want premium ad-free content? Duh. Content that's not censored by big tech, of course. But with SD Insider, you can get behind the scenes and a whole lot more. Link in the description. I made a couple, I'm making notes as, you, as you're talking. What I, what I like to do, again, studying violence, fear, aggression, like for over 40 years now my whole thing as as uh i'm not a I'm not a research scientist i play one on zoom though but i i for decades and decades of of listening to violent encounters and from from tier one military teams that i've trained all the way down to a school teacher or a single mom or whatever there are threads and that's what i was looking for what are the threads? So after after years and years of doing synthetic scenarios and actually analyzing real events, uh, what what you did there, and this is what we talk about, the three eyes, instincts, intuition. So instincts, the way I describe them, are things that are hardwired in your body. Like if you were out in the woods and you heard a rattle sound, you wouldn't think it was a mini tambourine band. Your nervous system would go, that's that's a rattlesnake. And it would react to that. So if you hit a golf ball into the woods and you're leaning over to get your ball and you see a stick in the grass, your body will react as if it's a snake. It won't err on the side of danger. It errs on the side of survival. That's how I describe instincts to the layperson. Intuition is interesting and I love intuition. Uh, I describe intuition as things go to be true, but you don't have the proof or the evidence yet. Your intuition said 
there is danger close. You had no evidence. You had no proof. The unfortunate victim might have gone, had the same bad feeling, went, that's weird, and went exploring without the training or the assets. So if that was a SWAT team went, okay, something's wrong here, there's at least training to pie that next room and 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 figure out, okay, if this happens, things are going to kick off fast. So the, the trained person and the untrained person still has the amazing organic neurobiology of survival, the neuroscience of, of thinking. That's why when, when we talk about, again, our approach to self-defense, it's it's got to be based on the sciences that allow us to locomote the, the planet, right? How do we move? How do we think? How do we feel? So the, what you did there is you choose, and, and this is, uh, Chris, we just had a big, big talk on that. The overarching, like the umbrella concept in everything we teach about personal safety is always choose safety. Always, what is the safest thing you could do right now? And the safest thing that you did there was stop going in that direction. And we actually make this joke that your intuition is like a, a GPS machine in your head. And you've all plugged in a GPS, right? And GPS make mistakes or you miss your turn. What does a GPS say to you when you've missed your turn? You're going the wrong way, make a legal U-turn, right? I tell people when your intuition says something's wrong here, I want you to hear make a legal U-turn, meaning turn around, get off the X as quickly as you can and start moving, which is what you did. I bumped into a, a woman who was on a date with Richard Ramirez. Anyone remember that name or know that name? Serial Strangler. killer. Serial killer. She was on a date with him. He was a good looking, smooth talker and she's on a date with him. And then something in the conversation, she, just her body just said, this guy's dangerous. And, and she looked at him and she said, Hey, I got to go to the bathroom. Would you order me another drink? And he said, yeah, sure. Gave him some like, Oh, now he's thinking about the future. I'll get her drunk. And then I'll, and then I'll get my tie out and kill her. She went to the bathroom and then she out, out the back door. But years later, and she actually, when when we bumped into her through a mutual friend, she, when she found out what I did, she tells me this story. And she didn't know, Jen, kind of what you're asking now is like, how did I know to move? And I go, that's like the magic of intuition. Every one of us on this call have been betrayed in a relationship. Everyone on this call has been betrayed, betrayed in business. Everyone listening to this has been betrayed in business and everyone listening to this has been betrayed in, a, in a, a relationship, friendship or romantic. When I'm doing my seminars, I go, who here has been betrayed in XYZ? Every hand comes up. How many of you, after you got over the emotional betrayal, turned to somebody when I knew that was going to happen? Every single person. And I asked the question rhetorically, if you knew it was going to happen, why do you let it happen? And this comes back to the cognitive dissonance, the denial that's more important than understanding the nerdy. My my neuron wasn't myelinated with the right signal speed to, okay, like we can make this way simpler. If you got a bad feeling about anything, stop, look around, move the other way, do your research. Like in, in your case, the research was get the hell out of there. And you found out like 12 hours later, holy shit. So kudos for, for listening to your intuition. <laughs> Back to your example of this woman on the date, I, I wonder how many people would have the the nerve to walk out the back door instead and instead of being like, oh man, this guy's going to think I'm a freak, I'm a jerk. Like, yeah. there's not seeing anything here and you start to rationalize. And what I would tell people is don't, don't rationalize. You trust your instinct. Mm -hmm. As you mentioned, Jen, we've had a lot of people on recently to discuss these subjects. And one recurring theme that one person after another has mentioned is that we're the only creatures on the planet who will ignore their intuition. And any other animal sees danger or senses danger in this case and reacts appropriately. Yet we will rationalize it as, as you said. So that's just an interesting the point. The gazelle, the gazelle is not concerned about being embarrassed in front of the other gazelles. It's, it's, they're not, right. he's not that. He just wants to not be dinner. And one of the, I've been thinking about this for a long time too. Like, why? Why are we like this as humans? And all I can think is that our, our environments are pretty safe. We rely on, most people rely on the police or, hey, I'm in a, a crowded place. There's people around, they'll help me. No, they won't. They're going to record you. 
but um, but you are your you, you're your own you're the only person who's guaranteed to have an interest in protecting you. And I had you a, have- it, sorry, Jen. I just I had an interesting discussion offline with Dr. Jason Dean from Brave TV earlier this week, and ironically, I'll be with him in a few hours as well. <clears throat> and since he started watching these shows that we've been doing on Survival Dispatch News on situational awareness, sudden violence, he was on his way back from Tampa last weekend with his wife, needed fuel pulled into a gas station off of I-4 on the west side of Orlando, got a really bad feeling that he shouldn't have stopped at that particular gas station, jumped right back on the interstate and said to his wife, this is precisely what all of the experts on Survival Dispatch News have been saying. He said it just didn't feel right. They went to the next one. It was busy. It was in a better part of Orlando. And like Tony always says, so by choosing safety, what did you lose? What Did he lose a minute by going off the interstate and back on? Let me let me piggyback on that, and that's that's a, a great addition. And as well, Jen, you mentioned that that in society we don't people are conflict adverse, right? If uh, if we go back a couple hundred years, and we were all we all knew at a hunt and gather, and and tribes we knew that tribes might come and pillage and if you went out and saw somebody and you were just like a caveman kid you didn't go hi what's up you'd be like you go shit you'd hide and you run and you come back and you tell people i just saw some people that aren't part of our our community we we have uh been domesticated in 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 the same way that animals get domesticated uh, obviously there's some amazingly positive things about the way the world has grown and civilization and so on and forth but the downside now is, and I'll, I'll use a, a term that was shared, well, it was coined by uh, Jack Donovan. He had me on his podcast. He wrote a fantastic treatise that uh, uh, called Violence is Golden. I don't know if any of you ever read that, but it's a wonderful short uh, treatise called Violence is Golden. And I was on his podcast and I was explaining how you we need to be our own bodyguard. And it's not just learning the physical. We need to have, uh, like, how do we uh, amplify our situational awareness where that has been stymied because of technology, because of walls around the castle, because people go, well, call call the guards. And now call the guards is 911. Well, I make a joke. It's not a joke. You're the first responder in your fight. The first responder that you called is the second responder. You're the first person there. And violence happens fast. Violence doesn't care what martial art you study. Violence doesn't care if you're a, a liberal or a, or or a Republican. Violence doesn't care if it's look what look what happened overseas. Violence just doesn't care. What are you going to do? The, the the kind of the last thing I wanted to add about this true safety model is again in educating and inspiring people with like your story, Jen, and sharing this through the survival dispatch uh, world is. The message is this, at a cellular level, we have a built-in radar system called intuition that is then connected through an intricate interleaving process with your instincts. And whether you're right or wrong, always choose safety. Because if you, if, if I, if I'm, if you and I are out walking and I go, shit, run, and we run, and I go, what was that? You go, man, I just had a really bad feeling there. And then we, let's say there's cameras up there and a bunny rabbit goes over the the trail. You're you're all going to laugh at me. You go, Blower, you were scared by a bunny rabbit. I was, I sensed something was about to change in the forest. And it'll be a funny story. We laugh. But imagine if we had ignored it and it was a hungry cougar or a hungry bear. So I always say, like, in choose safety, I always say there's no downside to choosing safety. If it was something, guess what? You're safe. If it was nothing, guess what? You're safe. And maybe it's a funny story after. And I'm Jason Salyer with Survival Dispatch. As a Survival Dispatch insider, you'll be able to gain the knowledge, the skills, and equipment necessary to protect your family when it really, really matters. They'll provide crucial information on such things as stockpiling food, medical necessities, communication plans. You will receive specific actionable plans. Visit survivaldispatch.com to get started. And you did see the little white innocent looking bunny and Monty Python that decapitated everyone, right? Right, so- right. The killer rabbit. Run away, run away. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So, all right. So this, the second scenario is, uh, it's pretty simple and 
I'll, I'll let you guys dissect it and, and talk about it without saying much more about it. But I was, um, before my dad died, I was going to visit him. He's in the hospital and I kind of made a quick trip out to Colorado and I rented a car. I just wanted to stop by a grocery store and, and get some food for my hotel but on my drive in. It was, I, I chose a place that looked like it was pretty, pretty safe area. Wasn't really worried about it. I parked. One of the things I do is... I, I try to have some space. I, I always tell Chris, in my mind, space and distance is safety to me. It, I, I have more mm. options if I have distance and space. So kind of walking down the middle of this, uh, a parking lot row, and just out of nowhere, this kid, and I say kid relative to me, but maybe early 20s, looks a little disheveled. He's got a backpack on, nothing in his hands comes screaming out from between these cars and is is closing in on me fast he's like give me your phone I'll just get up up and show you what I did but I uh I was I'm like out there and I just I went no like that and just like like really loud no and just an aggressive thing at him and (laughs) I thought he was gonna fall over backwards (laughs) It it almost made me laugh but he like he stopped and he beat feet the other way. And I was like, well, that was easy. <laughs> I'm glad that worked out the way it did. So anyway, I'll just I'll leave let, it and let you guys dissect I'll, it. <laughs> I'll, let, I'll let Tony and Jason weigh in on this. But it's worth noting that Jen is somewhere around 110, 114 pounds soaking <laughs> wet. Yeah, you may you may appear as easy prey. But uh, according to what how you responded, you were so much. And he just beat feet. So that was that, that was the smart tactic predators are always looking for the easy prey right there mm-hmm. whether you're talking about the lion in the serengeti looking for the easiest thing that's not going to hurt them not going to not going to injure them in some possible way and he thought you were that potential easy target and clearly you were not and i think that that was about as good of a response as anybody could ask for uh, jen had you been taught that in any martial art system before it was totally just intuitive and you just went for it it's, it was intuitive and i'm like well, I don't have much here. It just was like, how, and it, it kind of pissed me off too. I was just like, no, I'm not going to need my phone, man. <laughs> like, I'm not going to give you my phone. <laughs> so, so what's, what's interesting is there's, there's a bunch of factors. People ask me all the time, Hey, is it okay if I do this? And they suggest like a strategy. And I always say, you can do whatever you want, provided it doesn't change the outcome you wanted. Hypothetically, what would have happened if he had flinched and then put up his hands and went, oh, you want to fight? And now you're fighting because you you basically it came at him, you went into the Incredible Hulk and you went, fuck off, right? You did that. So this is if, like, and and I'm not, I'm not the contrarian. I love the conversation. So when I'm, it's rhetorical when I say, well, what if he would have done this? Because I don't give a shit. He didn't. He ran. Like what Jason said, that was perfect. But there are different situations where being really quiet would have been more effective. Not in, not in that. Or communicating could have been more effective. Right. So there's a or or the fact that maybe what and this is a good one for you, Tony. Like, what information did she subconsciously gain from him stopping short? You know, he stopped and yelled at her, as opposed to just taking her down, you know, or just or or approaching her in a different way, you know, closing the gap and grabbing her. Like that's that gives that provides some information, right? So there's there's a bunch of things that and. Uh, Chris knows I got to, I just got to be careful. I got to, I got to censor myself because it's so easy for me to open multiple rabbit holes. And then like nine hours later, Zoom is <laughs> calling going, Hey, uh, you're over your limit for today. Did you have Blower on the talk, on the show again? So, so that's not be, Zoom. That's, that's my wife. Right. So, <laughs> so I want to, so I, I, I also, it's information overload. There's a metaphoric button we all have that I have coined the indignation button. Kind of like what we felt as a nation after 9-11, like that, how dare you? And and there's a button that we can all hit in a personal defense situation, but we've got to remember it. What, where my mind went right away is, uh, had you been uh, leaving a party where you had just had like two glasses of wine and you were in a good mood, you might have been like, what the fuck? Get the fuck away from me. The fact that you're going to see your dad. Totally. And you were you were angry at life because you knew what was coming, right? The fact that you're highly trained, you're an extreme athlete, like that came, that 
those are the intangibles where if I took somebody who was you know, grew up in this generation with safe spaces and and um, can I say pronouns without getting canceled? Yeah, right. That person would have gone like this, right? There were there were factors came together serendipitously that made you that made you do that because I'm sure you've had other altercations and situations where you were just stunned for a few seconds and and didn't do anything like it was this. So you, I would look at that as, again, the three eyes, your instincts and your intuition said, I'm doing that. And that worked. I've been in situations where I've whispered to somebody where I've said, Hey, seriously, like, is this, is this what we want to do right now? And, but I've already done the Robert Downey Jr. Sherlock Holmes to them. You remember in, in where in slow motion, he sees the fight. So when I'm close to somebody, I'm analyzing their improvised weapons. If I think they're carrying something. And I'm trying to morally, ethically, legally defuse it, but I've already started the fight if it kicks off. What that has done is improved the gap time between stimulus response. As you're talking about this, the thing that that it makes me think about is the importance of when you step out into the environment, and again, this gets back to being domesticated and not having this, this idea in your head, you should just have the idea in your head that you may have to protect yourself, not in a not in a I'm freaked out kind of way, but just as like a primer so that you don't have to light the fuse before you start. But like the fuse should be lit. If sure. that makes sense. Yeah, no, so- and, and and that's that's consistent with our recommendations to people. We break it down. We, we call this the timeline of violence that when you're out in the real world. And, and it's amazing how my brain hijacks me because we're most vulnerable by people who are not part of the outer world. We're most vulnerable for people who are in our world, our circle of trust. And that's an important conversation to get into. But in this here, there's what we call the three Ds, detect, diffuse, defend. Detect, that's our situational awareness. Defuse, spelled D-E-F-U-S-E. Now, if we can't avoid this verbal, what are you gonna what are you gonna say to de-escalate? And this is interesting with your scenario, because when I tell people de-escalate, they think of some sort of like moderator intelligent de-escalation where you screaming, net the fuck, whatever you said to the guy, people go, Well, that wasn't de-escalation, right? You could you're screaming at the guy. So my question would be, did they fight or did he leave? If he left, it was de-escalation. So what's what's crazy, and we talk about this at class, there's times to scream, get the fuck out of here and 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 be that aggressive. And then there's times to feign fear. And uh like if if, if someone has a gun for you at, at, at 10 feet out, you may want to feign fear and get them closer because there's no way you're gonna do a, a gun disarm or get to your weapon. At, at this distance, if you've got no cover or nothing to throw. And one other one other piece of this is that he was not a big guy. He looked like he was a disheveled young guy who didn't look super fit. If that was you coming out, out at me from between, my approach, I'm sure, would have been very different. I probably would have started running as fast as I could. Well, well, but, but, that's, but that's the magic of a holistic system based on principles. So you said something interesting. You use the word I use all the time, prime. When... I know that that if uh, if Jason jumped through the screen right now, like in the Matrix, that I wouldn't go wax on, wax off. I'd go, what the fuck, right? There'd be a startle response. So studying that startle response, realizing that that when we flinch, there's no conscious thought to flinch. Your brain doesn't go, hey, that's coming to your head really fast. You should flinch, right? So all of you have flinched on this call and everyone listening has flinched but you've never once in your life said flinch. So it's a non-conscious survival response hardwired in us. There's a part of our brain that just goes, situational awareness was compromised, protect your command center, protect your head, because that's your brain, that's where you breathe, that's where you hear, that's where you see, that's your special forces as far as the senses go. The, knowing that when I'm in an altercation with somebody, there's four classic nonviolent postures we take, which are Trojan horse principles. So I could have my hands on my hips. I could have my arms crossed. I could have what's called a half negotiator or a full negotiator. When we're training them, we're priming our nervous system, recognizing that the startle response, if I retract it, becomes the negotiator. The startle response, if I retract it, put a hand down, becomes, you see the connection? They all look like they're part of the same uh, uh, Lego block system or Gumby. You guys remember Gumby, right? Where I could bend the hands. 
you what you're doing with your body for priming it for sudden violence or sudden movement can be done with your mind by doing what you're doing and that is if you get out of your car and you and you don't look at your phone right away you don't rumble for your rumble in your purse for your keys you get out of your car and you stop and your ears your your i did this last night when i pulled up my house i open my car door and i stop and i wait do i hear any footsteps do i hear my dog barking does that do, does my in the same way on your bike story is my nervous system trying to send me a message and then when when i get the all clear on the three eyes i move and it's just a, it's just a momentary pause um but it's 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 beautiful cuz the what you're describing without the training is 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 kind of like a visceral example of the system that i spent decades reinforcing that if we let if we integrate and trust the, our body as a human weapon system i refer to us as human weapon system if we if we understand the neurobiology of survival and the kinesiology and biomechanics and the psychology then we can be formidable even without and, and everyone can a 110 yes. pound person can yeah just getting back to the the original concept of how our brains filter things out your brain can be taught to look for the unusual and you'll actually start to right. see those things. It's it's all conditioning and it's all part of just looking around your environment and wherever you are and say, is there anything unusual here? And pretty soon you'll start to see yeah. those. Things. But uh, so I, wa I want to go to the yeah. third scenario, unless you go ahead. Something that I like to do oftentimes, especially when I'm in public places, gas stations, all that kind of stuff, I like to kind of... Uh, put my mind in a place where I would pretend to be the bad guy. Like if I was the bad guy, what would I do? And how would I take advantage of this situation? How would I take advantage of the people around me, perhaps? And how would I take advantage of myself if I was you know, had to go up against myself? And, and there's, there's so many opportunities, but the opportunities come if you next time you're out and about, take a look around and look at look at what's going on. The opportunities come when people are the least aware when they're in their mind doing something like they're changing the tire on the side of the road, they're pumping the gas, they're paying for the thing, they're doing that stuff. That's when you would pounce on them. And that'd be the easiest way. And if you don't, and if, and as the, as the, uh, as the person that's attempting to not be attacked, if you can minimize those times when you are unaware as much as possible, everybody's got to do things and everybody's got to focus on something from time to time where you're not situationally aware. But if you can minimize those things, especially in more dangerous environments, I think that that's a big win. What part of my situational awareness is situation is awareness of self. Like, how am I coming across to people? Um, my husband likes to call me the M and M crunchy on the outside, <laughs> sweet on the inside. But he's like, man, the first time I saw you walk, it was like just all business. Like, I I walk with a purpose. I walk with confidence. I and I guess that's just me. But but. I like to know how am I coming across? Do I come across as someone who's wealthy? Do I come across as someone who's confident? That's just part of it. But all right. So the third scenario was uh, I had gone down to Miami for just a quick business trip, just a quick meeting. And I'd never been there. I stayed on South Beach at some cheesy Holiday Inn, or something, whatever. It was so expensive. I'm like, well, I'll just I'll, I'll pick the, the cheesy, nice spot on the beach. But anyway, so I got down there at night. I uh, was just walking around. I was on my phone talking with my husband and I just wanted to go check out the boardwalk. There were a lot of people out there where the the gate comes into the hotel. It's a locked gate. You have to use your key and it goes out onto this boardwalk. I don't know if you guys are familiar with it. I wasn't, <clears throat> but um, almost immediately I, I go out of the gate. I'm, I'm talking on the phone with my husband, all, all sorts of people going both directions. And I see, I, I'm kind of paying attention, like who's around me, of course, but I see a guy walking, coming the other way, young guy, very big muscular guy. And I just see him out of the corner of my eye, just kind of look like that and start to slow down. And I was like, oh man, that's weird. I'm walking and just pretending to look around and he had made the U-turn and is coming behind me. And there are all sorts of these like little nooks and crannies along there. There's places that are well lit, places that aren't well lit, lots of shrubbery. Parts of this boardwalk have like a little median area. I was like, I, I got it. I've got a bad feeling about this guy. Yeah, I'm continuing 
to talk and I, I start to tell my husband about it. I'm like, I'm just going to see if he really is following me. And there was this long kind of median area with some shrubbery or something in it. I did like, uh, I'm pretending like I'm going to walk and someone's walking sort of behind me and I use them sort of as cover and I make a quick U-turn there and sure as hell, this guy, this guy's coming. And now I'm in like, not a really great lit area. I just, I, and it was pretty quick after I'd come out of the hotel. So I, I like sped up because he was a little ways behind me and, and it was going to, so I sped up fast and I quick got into that gate locked behind me and he was there and he tried to get in that gate could have jumped the fence he didn't but uh I was just like wow like that guy like he was definitely he was definitely on a mission I just couldn't believe it so your thoughts oh but my one thought about that was um first of all paying attention even if you're on your phone just notice notice those things is someone following me or not but then the other thing was using my environment to to my advantage to get a tactical advantage in terms of being able to create space where I know he couldn't he I it was I don't know I'm sure there are a lot of things I could have done better there well we've oh, we've so- be, we've beaten to death the subject of being gas station ready and the reason that I mention that is is one of the common mistakes made by people at gas stations is they've got their weapon of mass distraction their phone so they're in between the car, the pump, and their face is buried in the phone, and the bad guys are looking for that. So I think regardless of the context, whether you're at the gas station or walking you know, down the boardwalk at South Beach, is that the perception is that you're automatically vulnerable because you're dealing, you're working with your phone. Kudos for you being more aware than the average person. But if you think of the average person walking down the sidewalk with their face buried in their phone... They don't notice anything around them and they're a sitting duck, they're target. So that's what I have to say on that. Stop and like people will actually almost like run into funny. <laughs> Jen, Jen, were you, uh, did you have a, a purse with you when you were I uh, walking? Have, I never have a purse with me. Okay. I don't, I don't carry one, but there was just like, and, and was the boardwalk uh, fairly crowded or was pretty quiet that well, night? I don't know. There were definitely, there were people around, but the area that I would have gone into did not have a lot of people and it was a lot darker. To me, this story is exactly the same as story number one in terms of you as a human weapon, right? Your intuition, your instincts fired. You didn't use cognitive dissonance. You didn't ignore it. You didn't do anything weird. You just, you trusted it right away. You checked it out. Are there other things like, so you said something right at the beginning. I can't remember it where you, you, it was almost a little self-deprecating where we're supposed to be allowed to go out and enjoy the world. What we need to, in the same way, uh, like if you go drive later today, you're not going to pull out onto the street without looking both ways. You're not going to just go through intersections because you're driving and other people need to look out for you. So I always tell people like the, the situational awareness skills that get you across the street as a pedestrian, the situational awareness skills that you use to drive and navigate uh, traffic and shitty drivers who are on their phone texting or drunk or talking or adjusting the radio. Those are the same skills that you as as a person need to use to navigate the world. So I like to demystify that right away because a lot of you are like, well, what do I do to get better at self-defense? Well, you need to develop your D1 skill set. And I want to go back a few minutes because Jason, the, the recommendation you made of like looking at people you see as vulnerable, if you're an attacker, that's almost almost verbatim one of the exercises I have people do. I said, you want to really uh, take it to the next level is for a day or whatever you need with a little notebook, Mark, walk around and note every person that you could attack and look at who could you kidnap, whose purse could you grab, whose car could you steal, when and why and 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 how. And it'll be creepy and weird and you might feel uncomfortable. But if you're at a gas station and you see someone on your phone with the car open and the purse sitting there and the key's still in there, you could go, well, I could steal their car. I could steal their purse. I could probably, if I had a, a tool of intimidation, put them in the trunk and drive away all because of this. What's magical about that is when you do that exercise, your your brain's RAS, reticular activating system, is suddenly educated at another level. And the RAS, big fancy word, if you decide today that you need a new car and this is your budget and you you go, I want a blue XYZ 
uh, pickup truck. That day, you'll notice nine of them on the road on your way to work or wherever. They were there yesterday, but until you told your brain, this is important to me, you won't notice them. So when training people to be safer, it's important for a phase of the education is to go, what do bad guys want? What do they not want? Bad guys only want property, body, or life. It's a short list, which is why I asked you, did you have a nice purse or something on? He didn't. So was he just there to steal the phone? Was he there to maybe uh, drug you with something, walk up to you, you know, hit you with something, you know, put his arm around you? And and what? who the hell knows what it was? The most important thing is you had a bad feeling and you chose safety. We don't need to make it magical or mystical. You're... And I'll tell you something here. This is so important. Everyone listening to this podcast, listen to this line. It is the most important thing that I say in every seminar. Every victim of violence who lived to tell the tale said they had a bad feeling before the attack. Every single one. Not 90%, not 80%, not 70 100% said I had a bad feeling. Which means, although the intuition apparatus or, or strategy seems like a black box for many people. I'm just supposed to listen to my intuition. Every victim will live to tell the tale. So if you get a, a bad feeling about something, your immediate action drill, just like a military immediate action drill, is choose safety. What is the safest thing you could do? In your case here, you went, I'm going to see if this is real. You did some sort of like a counter surveillance route. You went, holy shit, he is following me. You did that. Now, what I would do if we were doing a private lesson, which we are about to, I would say, what are some other what are some other things that you could have done? Could you have run up to a group of three guys and, and walked up to somebody and said, quickly, give me a kiss and a hug. Pretend we know each other. There's a guy following me. And now suddenly you're around three guys. And one of them would have went, who, who's fucking following you? And there might have been a fight on, right? Uh, but now you're three and four people, uh, there there are little strategies and psychologies you could do. My daughter calls me Can one I, day. I just, Please. That is definitely a good lesson for me. I tend to be uh, very independent. I don't need anyone to help me. I'm I'm kind of out here on my own. I don't I don't expect other people to help me. But but, but that's I, I, but that's fine. That's no no no. But but I like but I like that. I like that opens my brain to um, allowing help f from other people and, and seeking it out. Well, we, we do, so many people get mugged or attacked in parking lots after leaving a bar drunk or a restaurant where they had a mini altercation with people. And, and I go like, there is no doorman, security, a restaurant manager that I've ever met that if I walked up and I said, listen, would you walk me to my car, please? Could you get a couple of bartenders, make sure I get in my car safe? Because those guys are creeping me out. They said something kind of rude, and I don't want to. I don't want to get up and go alone. There's not one as 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 for as many toxic masculinity bullshit memes out there and all that. There are real men that will, and I'm not just talking to Jason. Could do that. I could do that. I could. Well, if I ask properly, right, it'll happen. We just don't think to do that. So you can be fiercely independent, but then your intuition is going to say. You need a cavalry right now. You need some assets. You need, and it's just the idea of, of that. So that's a big part of our training too. Like for example, you step into an elevator, you press your floor, and then all of a sudden as the door's closing, hands open up and that back hair on the back of your head stands up. And some guy gets in and he stands in the corner, like in your blind spot. And you're going, and most people will not get out of the elevator. They're like, oh shit, I don't want to rock the boat. It's antisocial. What's that? It, it's ego, right? I don't, like, even, I, I, I don't even know that it's ego all the time. I think it's the social conditioning of don't rock the boat. Uh, don't create conflict. Get everyone to like you. Yeah. As opposed to trust your instincts, trust your intuition. So if I said to you, Jen, how are you going to get out of the elevator without, without betraying the element of surprise, without this guy grabbing you by the hair and pulling you back in? So bad guys only want property, body, or life. He's going to either mug you or rape you or kill you in the elevator if it's a real bad guy, right? So how do you get out without alerting him? If the doors opened, I would hesitate for a minute, uh, for a second, like, like I'm not going to get out. And then right. as they start to close, like jump for it. Right. But then he can the doors will kick open and he could jump out. And now the fight's in the hallway. Now, what if you said, remember the 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 strategy I gave you, you're following, you're doing your counter surveillance. He is following me. You're walking. 
you're going, holy shit. And then you realize, oh, you dropped your card or or you're reaching into your car to get into the gate. And you realize it's not there. And then you remember, Tony said, solicit the age, aid of and, and recruit courageous bystanders. And you and you beeline it over and you go, John. And the guy looks at you because he's not John. And you go, quickly, give me a hug. Pretend we know each other. There's a guy following me. Right. And now you go, it's that, is there a big guy there? You're describing the guy. And now people are like looking. And then that guy's beelining it, right? So you're in the elevator. You got a bad feeling. And you say to the guy, oh, my God, I, I forgot my, my keys to my apartment. Would you hold the elevator door for me? Because what you've done is you've said, I'm coming back with the keys to my apartment. You can follow me there and you can attack me there. It's again, there's there's a strategy in the dis- disinformation element that everyone can do and learn really easily. Uh, you just got to think about these things in uh, unique to, let's say, an ATM scenario, a carjacking scenario, a being followed scenario. So, but that's, that's just an example. Uh, great example. And again, it, it all gets back to the fluidity of the situation and, and being able to think. One of the one of the things that I was actually listening to a, a podcast with you and Chris, and one of the things that you talked about is engaging the brain, because as soon as you start to engage the brain, you're suppressing all of the, the catecholamine dump and you're 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 starting to process and that's the only way you'll survive is if you're processing not reacting in my opinion i i think the thing that um, is common to all of these scenarios and i'll go into the last most scary one in a minute but it was the idea that i was thinking i was processing i was like wow this is happening what do i do what are my options and then the other thing that i do is uh, i actually do do box breathing when um, if I'm just kind of hanging out and I'm starting to get freaked out about something, whether it's testifying in court or whatever, I'm like, wow, I'm, I, f- I feel like I'm having this adrenaline surge. I need to suppress that. And I'll, I'll do some box breathing or, or something to, to suppress yeah. it. That, that's great self-awareness. This just popped into my, my head. The breathing is important if you're, you're there's so much research on, on the power of breathing. And in, in a real confrontation, you can't go from sympathetic to parasympathetic, nor do you want to. So there's a lot of people out there that have that completely wrong, but but you still need to control your breathing, right? And and having an intentional breath practice, you, your, your connection between the, the your your all of the breathing systems in your brain. And, and your nervous system is, is well documented. But think about it as like stamina and endurance. You can't, if somebody's chasing you, you can't on the spot improve your stamina and endurance. You need to have done that before. So if I'm, if I got a serial killer in the house and I'm hiding and I'm going, ah, ah, and you're like, oh my God, I'm breathing really loud. He's going to catch me. You, the, the time to learn how to breathe and control your breathing isn't during a crisis. So everyone listening, you should be doing some meditation and some breathing and learn these skills in advance. You, I wanted to share a story. I get this call from my daughter several years ago. She's at SeaWorld uh, with a bunch of friends. And she calls me. She goes, Dad, I think this guy was following us, really creeping me out. I went like, where? What is he? Is he still there? Like I'm on, on the phone. With you. She goes, no, he's gone now. We're driving home. I said, did you walk to your... Did he you see your, the car you got in? Does he you have your driver's license? He's no, completely disappeared. I said, how do you... And she goes, well, let me tell you what happened. They're walking, uh, my daughter and three teen, teenage girlfriends, all you know, cute, good looking, 16, 17 years old. And this guy's following them. And she goes like this. She says to her friends, she doesn't want to scare them. She says, hey, guys, let's to take a selfie. And she pauses and turns. They're walking. And she's noticed this guy. And she says, everyone stop. And she turns and she puts her phone on. And she does this here. She goes like this. She goes, smile. And she lifts it and takes a picture of the guy who has stopped when they stopped. And she said, I knew he was following me because he stopped when we took the picture. But at least if something happened, I got a picture of him. We went into the bathroom. We stayed there like an extraordinary long time. And then I came out and kind of looked around and he wasn't there. And I checked and I was like, holy shit, that was like great thinking, sweetie, that you did all that. But bad guys don't want to get caught and they don't want to get hurt. 
So when he saw the phone come up and saw the picture, he knew right away and, and he split. Um, I, I, I've used that many times. If, uh, nice. if, if there's someone in, like who's doing weird stuff on the road. Yeah. One time I was, uh, this, this is a total aside, but like if someone's doing something weird on the road, I'll take a picture of them and their license plate. So it's obvious that I've done that. It's weird stuff happens on the road. But uh, yeah. one night, this wasn't part of my scenario and it, there's nothing to a whole lot to do about it. But I was, I, I love riding Harleys. <laughs> I've got this 750 pound motorcycle. <laughs> I was riding home from work and it was nighttime. I live on an, an, a dark country road and I was going behind a pickup truck. I always leave enough space. And this guy like lays on his brakes and comes to a stop. And I was like, wow, holy crap. I'm really glad that guy was ahead of me. He must have seen a deer or something like that could have killed me. So we get back up to speed and we're going like 45 miles an hour. And now he really lays on the brakes, like lays down rubber, so an old piece of crap truck. And then I was just like, holy shit, this guy's trying to hurt me. I was like, wow. So and it pissed me off. So I, I lit him up with my brights and then he takes off and he, he like makes this super quick turn into a side road. And I was just like, now is he like going to get behind me? What's he going to do? So I just like, I took off and went super fast and, and just got away and, and went home. But man, I couldn't believe it. Crazy. It was, People are crazy. Yeah, it was crazy. All right. Last scenario. This is probably one of the stupider things I've ever done in my life. <laughs> Somehow got away with it, but we were traveling down to my mother-in-law's hundredth birthday party and, and coming up and we had our, our truck and trailer. We're going through the central Valley of California, Northern California, maybe six miles south of Corning. I don't know if you're familiar with that part of the country, that area, but it's just rural, rural farmland, central, central California. Not a lot there. My husband was going to go through the truck stop and fill up with fuel and def. He's got a diesel like pickup. And I was going to run run across the street and just pick up some fast food at a Taco Bell or something. So the, there's this two lane highway. If you go to the left and you go down about 100 yards, that's where the, the big truck stop is. And then if you go right, there's a really old service station there. And then way in the back and it's all there's shrubs and stuff along this highway way tucked in the back is this taco bell so we get to the there's a four-way stop there and we get to the stop and i was like well why don't i just hop out right here so i don't have to like walk the whole distance and normally i at least carry we're in california so you can't really carry much but normally i at least carry like a little flashlight attack light and a knife with me but i didn't i just hopped out with my my phone, which has a wallet on it. I just hop out at that corner and he takes off the other way. And, and I go, there's just a couple of cars in that old service station because the other side is much nicer. But I go back to the Taco Bell and their, the lobby's closed because of COVID and, and minimal staffing. So it says go to the drive-through. So I walk behind there and there's like, no one can see back there. It, it is a, it's not a good place to be by yourself. And I'm not even thinking about it. So I go back there and I knock on the window. And of course, they didn't have the food that we had ordered like a half an hour before. So they said, oh, go to the front. We'll bring it out when it's ready. So I go to the front and I look over and I see this. And this is not racist. I'm just describing the person in this Central Valley area, an African-American male. He's maybe mid-20s, very muscular just wearing shorts and he's, he's walk he's, he's just kind of dreading. I, I don't, I don't know if I can demonstrate how he's walking, but it's just like, he's looking at me and he's just like, like, he's not moving with a purpose. He's not, he's not going back to the Taco Bell to get Taco Bell. And, and he's looking back where I had gone and I'm watching him and he looks over and he sees me and he stopped and he starts slowly walking towards me. And I'm like, holy shit. I'm like out in the middle of of this place. There's no one here. There's no one. There are a couple of workers in this. So there's one car. I'm sure it was the employee's car. And I'm like, all right, that's all I got. <laughs> so I, I quickly moved behind that car so that at least there's a car between me and him. And he sees that I do that. And he stops and he and he starts slowly walking back towards this service station. And it's probably 30 yards 
There's nothing between, and that's the only way I can go. Um, so he starts slowly walking back there. And as he's doing that, the lady comes to the door um, and says, here's your food. So why I even bothered? I don't know. But so I went over, I grabbed the food and I said, make sure you keep the door locked. I didn't want to go in there and be trapped in there. And I said, just make sure you keep the door locked. There's a really bad dude out here and keep your eye out for him. She like quickly <laughs> closes the door and locks it. I start walking, but I'm like walking as far as I can back that direction. And he's he keeps looking over his shoulder, seeing where I am. And I'm, I'm kind of thinking back and I'm like, what am I getting myself into? What else is there? And I remember seeing uh, like a little minivan with three three black guys in it. And I'm like, okay, that's what's there. I just, I'm like, how do I get out of here? Um, my phone doesn't have cell coverage. I can't call anyone. I'm kind of on my own. I'm I'm just staying way far. He knows the direction. He's, I'm, I'm certain that he saw me jump out of the truck and he knows where I'm going and where I need to go. So he, he's there and I see, so a pickup truck comes into this, this service station. And I go in front of it. And then there another little minivan is over there. And I can see he's walking that that direction to the point that I he thinks I need to go. I know he can't see me. So I quickly I run, I run behind that car. And I, I jump over a ditch and I'm going to have to run across this highway. So I run across the highway. And I look back and that mofo is running across the highway too. And I'm like, well, again, holy shit, it's go time. You got to be kidding me. I run through across this field through to the service station. And there's like a, a I thought I was going to be able to run around. I did, I did have a, a weapon in our truck. So I was going to run around this building and find our truck and, and go that way. But there's a fence I can't get through. So I go through this little strip mall thing and I'm able to get all the way through to the back. And I look and he's there again. I'm like, wow, this guy's not stopping. I'm like, no truckers. This was the first time I was like, well, no truckers are good people. And they are usually pretty well defended. And they're, they're kind of like bikers. They look rough and, and tumble, but they're pretty much salt of the earth good people generally. I, I run, I, I don't see our truck anywhere. And I'm going to go and find a trucker and say like, hey, this guy's after me. Can you help me? But then I saw our truck and, and I'm like, open the truck <laughs> to my husband. He's like, God, what's wrong with you? And the, the guy disappeared after that. But I was but my thoughts on that were I cut corners. I jumped out in an unfamiliar place without like knowing what was there or, or whatever. And like, what, a what an idiot, like looking back, idiot. Yes. Idiot. No, I, I saved myself. I have no idea what was going to happen, but the whole point of it was that I just, I just on a whim, just jumped out in the middle of nowhere with nothing, no cell service, no weapon, no, nothing on my own. Like it, it was, it was a stupid mistake. I don't have anything to say to that. I think you summed it up. <laughs> the, the, you did everything wrong up to the point of doing everything right. And, and that's, that's, that's what makes for a good action movie, right? You're the hero in your own story. You, you, uh, my, my buddy who had the, uh, the, uh, attempted home invasion that could have escalated into, uh, uh something different. He, he totally compromised his situational awareness. He had his hands compromised, right? Like, so if you need to protect yourself, you don't want your your most important initial sense from any threat from a distance is your auditory sense, right? Energetically, we might get a bad feeling, but if our ears are listening to uh, music or a, a book or we're talking to somebody, it splits our focus. It dilutes what we need to what we need to pick up. So your the three main senses are auditory, visual, and tactile. So you did nothing wrong, but you did everything wrong. It, Jen, I've had so many people over the years that go, hey, I, I heard you you analyze stuff and you could help improve mind speed and confrontation management. Can I tell you about this this confrontation that I had? Can you tell me if I did if I how I how I did if I did it wrong? I think I made a bunch of mistakes. And I always tell people before giving any thoughts on it. I always tell them this, you did fine, but I didn't even tell you what I did. Well, you're not contacting me via seance. You're not writing me from jail. So you did fine. Now, if we were driving in a, in a unknown area that looked like a shitty part of, of the country and I'm shitty meaning in terms of danger profiling. And I said to you, like, so let's say you and I are on a road trip 
And I go, Jen, I'm going to go fill up. I'm going to drop you here across this street, 100 yards there. Behind that building is a, a Taco Bell. I would hope that now you would go, I'll go fill up with you and we'll grab some shit at the gas station. Or if you really want Taco Bell, we'll go to Taco Bell together, right? It's really, what are the lessons learned? You got through it. Again, you 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 were thinking the whole way through. When And this is why this the, the whole no fear program is so important. Because I tell people that when you start to think about fear as information, you can start to use it and convert it into a fuel to support courage. One of the lines in our program, and I love sharing it, is you can't be brave if you're not afraid. The primary ingredient of courage is fear. And nobody gets up and says, I'd like to be terrorized tonight. I hope I think my way through it. Right. So that just happens. And that's why I say like you did everything wrong and then you did everything right. And it's well, and- one, one of one of the comments that I, I got when this first happened, I, I posted something about it. And one of the very first things was you're a woman, you should never be out in public alone. And I was like, what am I in like Saudi Arabia or something right. like screw <laughs> that's like, are you kidding me? No way. Like, but I was totally unaware. I, all I was thinking about is like, what's the easiest thing to do? Totally unaware of what was even in that gas station or where I needed to go, or is this a good decision? It was just like a split second decision. This is easier. I'm just going to hop out right here. uh, Until I saw that guy, I was totally unaware of what was around me. I wasn't even. But that, but that's, but that's, that's how danger erupts, right? Opportunistic. He didn't know you were going to be there. It wasn't planned. He was like, he didn't have like a, a tracker on the truck from back home. He didn't know who you were. It was like, like, what's this crazy broad doing here alone? Holy shit. I'm going to kidnap her. Whatever it is. And, but if you go back to the choose safety model, the choose safety is never to be confused with playing it safe, which is what that comment was. Hey, just stay in your house and, and DoorDash food. Don't go out. Don't do road trips. Don't live, right? So so no, you're going to go out and do stuff. And then the moment, I do this all the time. This, so the true safety model also is about the, the metaphoric battle plan moving forward. I'm going somewhere. I go, I get out of an Uber in a city and I go, okay, you can drop me here. I get out and I go, oh man, I shouldn't have been dropped here. That sucks, Right. And right away, it's what what is the safest thing I could do right now? It's not, well, it's okay, I got a gun or I got a knife or I'm trained. I have avoided more altercations just because of following the true safety model. And it wasn't me going, uh, oh, Tony, out of fight, so fuck it, just move towards the danger. It's always about moving away from danger all the time. Whether, whether, it doesn't matter whether you're trained or untrained. Why do you want danger in your life? So true safety needs to be kind of like a well, you're walking in anything and a hologram pops up in front of you you got to cross the street choose safety uh, you got to go out on a date choose safety you got to you you you're like you're like Chris's friend hey let's get gas you get there and you go this gas station reeks of danger choose safety find another gas station i, th- I think Free. in this day and age with the sorry condition of our society whether you're a man or a woman it's probably best not to be going out at night by yourself in an unfamiliar area. The choose safety aspect being that, okay, my wife and I, we travel a fair bit. We interstate a fair bit. It it wouldn't be wise for us to go somewhere. We had a situation in the south side of Atlanta a while ago because of closed roads and redirecting and detours and whatnot. And we ended up in the wrong part of town, but it, it would have been even less wise if if we had got to the wrong part of town and it was nighttime and I said, you go there and I'll go here and we'll try to save a few minutes. I think just as a general rule of thumb, not going out alone at night, if it's avoidable, is probably the quickest and easiest way as far as choosing safety after dark is concerned. It's really funny. Our oldest daughter is, she's pretty cool. She's a Black Hawk pilot in the guard and a police officer. Wow. And then, so she and our oldest, who's who's happens to be male, were down in the San Francisco area. And- he wanted to go see some movie and at a particular theater that was in downtown San Francisco in the day is not a, a safe place. But, um, but the movie was going to get out. The one he wanted to see was going to get out really late. And she's like, no way. I'm not taking the BART train down there. I'm not going down there. And he's like, and she's like, I'll see a matinee, but I'm not going to go down there at night. And he's like, 
are you kidding me? Like you're a, you're a cop. Are you afraid? She's like, no, I'm not afraid, but I'm not going to put myself in a bad situation. <laughs> and that's a bad situation. And he got all pissed off and he's like, well, are you just not going to live? And she's like, no, I, I have a great life. <laughs> I have a fun life. Like, why don't, at what difference does it make if we watch this during the day or at night? So I, I think everything is risk management and you know, yep. making good choices. I, I always joke and say that you know, people that put safety first are an annoying breed of human. And I'm joking. He does. I'm joking. Right. <laughs> and the fact that people, and what I, is that people that stay home and they live in their little bunker where it's safe and they don't go outside and they don't experience life, that is annoying to me. I don't mean run blindly into dangerous situations and be unprepared and because we're going to fail at the limits of our experiences. They're going to fail at the limits of our training um, and, in our, and our abilities and what we've worked up to. So yeah, when I, when I joke and say safety first, people irritate me. It's, that's true. <laughs> but I don't mean put yourself in harm's way intentionally. And then the other thing is that's just, just crazy people out there. And we're rational thinkers, like all of us here and people watching for the most part um, are rational people logical thinking human beings and we don't act in crazy absurd ways but the truth is out in the real world there's some nut jobs out there that do not act or respond in the same ways that you would to normal stimuli they will do and say and i've been chased down the street by homeless people plenty times and it's just it is a sad situation but the fact is that those people can do harm to you and you just got to be aware that people don't always act so sane. And the other thing with as bad as the drug problem is meth, like one time on meth can cause psychosis. Oh, yeah. uh, it, the way it works with the dopamine receptors and things, it 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 truly causes psychosis. These they don't feel the same pain. They don't, they don't, they're not feeling pain. They're, they've got this superhuman strength. They're psychotic. They're dangerous people. And if you see someone who looks like a tweaker, just like avoid <laughs> eye contact, avoid all contact. Yeah, yeah. You can profile everyone. I profile everyone. I don't care what you call me, but if you look sketchy, you probably are sketchy. <laughs> <laughs> Tony and I put together a, a flow chart last week, just as a kind of general guideline on these topics it's uh, available on our website for a free download but it one of the steps that we put in there specifically says don't be afraid to profile people don't be afraid to stereotype who gives a shit if it's politically correct or not it could be the difference between life and death one more thing i wanted to back up in the conversation quickly add is jen when you mentioned box breathing i can't recall exactly who it was but somebody recently in, in the past week or so mentioned that there was a study done on people who went into condition black, completely froze up, and they were exposed to all these different stimuli that caused them to lock up, freeze up sort of thing. And one of the variables that was measured was their pulse ox, what their oxygen level was. And pretty much every single person who went into condition black, so they froze in the face of danger, their O2 level had plummeted precipitously. And they didn't have the oxygen even to power their brain to be cognizant and all those sort of things. So it's kind of interesting that you mentioned the breathing aspect. I've done some yoga in the past when I was competing. If you're powerlifting, breathing is a really important aspect of your timing to move the weight and whatnot. But I'm not an expert on breathing. It's just interesting how when people do go into that fight or flight or freeze type syndrome, that it's there's this physiological aspect to it as well, where their brain's not getting the oxygen it needs to actually function. And this is totally an aside, but the breathing is really interesting. Uh, purposeful breathing, even like three to five minutes a day has as impactful effects on blood pressure as blood pressure medicines. So I actually did a medical Mondays on this and just doing some some breathing exercises, especially against resistance, has really big impacts on health. It has really big impacts on, I think, your ability to manage stress, whether that is an emergency or just stressful situations in general. And it, I, I think it helps people be more in tune with themselves and, and kind of what's going on with them, around them. Tony mentioned meditation you know, people think that this is like a, a lot of people I think think it's BS. It's, it's really not. I think it's a really powerful tool. I think some of the, the best martial artists in the, in history used meditation, if, if I'm remembering correctly, but um, a lot of people think that this is not a redneck thing to do. <laughs> it, it should be. Everyone should do it. Back to ego. I, 
I don't, I didn't do yoga because I thought it was kind of a, a pussy thing to do, but here I, here I am in my mid fifties and not super flexible. And I'm like, man, I need to do some yoga or something. <laughs> You've got to have some thoughts on this. I know you have some thoughts. Nah, I kind of like the most important thing for me is, is, uh, is you keep it simple. You're a human weapon. Your instincts and intuition are already hardwired into you. And, and proof of principle is every time something has gone wrong, 99% of the time afterwards, you said, I knew that was going to happen. So you you disregarded this intuition that whispered into your head and your ego or your pride or your arrogance or your whatever said, no, we're, we got this. We're good. Every, every person is already equipped with the, with the toolbox to be a human weapon. You can all defend yourself regardless of gender experience. You just got to reconnect to what has been domesticated and, and, and start leaning into that. The choosing safety model can be applied to every aspect from relationships to fitness to to uh, business and most importantly to managing violence. It's what is the safest thing I could do right now. And you know, sometimes the safest thing to do is to charge the threat. Sometimes the safest thing to do is to sneak out the back. And there can't be ego or pride uh, associated with any strategic or tactical uh, decision making you know, for all the good that comic books and action movies have done it's also created this erroneous belief that we got to move like bruce lee or chuck norris or john wick to defend ourselves and we don't we just need to think and we need to realize that bad guys don't want to get caught they don't want to get hurt bad guys only want one of three things you can put together a battle plan pretty easily, but most of the work, if you want to avoid the physical, needs to be done in the D1, D2 part, detect and avoid, defuse and de-escalate. And if you do that well, there's a good chance that almost nothing will ever happen to you unless you happen to be in a profession in some sort of public safety or some sort of service where you're actually looking for bad guys in dangerous places, which means that you're in danger because of your profession. Otherwise, you can pretty much avoid most of it. Yep, good stuff, Tony. Anybody got anything else you want to add before we wrap up? Don't think so. I just want to say thanks for, for engaging in this conversation. I think it's really important, especially for women or kids or people who feel like they're more vulnerable, um, maybe feel unsafe. I just, I want to empower people. That's the whole point of of all of this is just empowering people to know that you, just like Tony said, you have it within you to, to be your own bodyguard and to be safe and still live your life. Uh, that's about it. Appreciate everybody's time. Thank you. Bye guys. Thank you. I'm Jason Sally with Survival Dispatch. And when disaster strikes, will you be ready? Power outages, natural disasters, economic collapse, and the knowledge, the skills, and equipment necessary to protect your family when it really, really matters. You can gain instant access to our team of survival experts. Stockpiling food, medical necessities, communication plans, proven techniques to help you get home, shelter in place, or bug out safely. Don't leave your family's safety to chance. Visit survivaldispatch.com to get started.